Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Today we are talking about mast cells in IBS and SIBO. And oh my gosh, this is going to open a whole can of worms. I hope you're prepared. There's going to be a series coming up about mast cells and histamine intolerance because this is such a common complex problem within the worlds of IBS and SIBO and even sometimes in IBD and reflux. So first off, I want to give you a little bit of an immunology crash course. It's going to be worth it. And then we'll talk about what the research has shown regarding irritable bowel syndrome and mast cells. But first we need to know what are mast cells and why should I care about them? Am I right? I'm right. So here is probably my favorite depiction. Look, it looks like I'm part of the Venn diagram now. <laughs> this is my favorite depiction of the immune system that I've been able to find. So I'm going to go ahead and scribble on their picture from Nature Cancer a little bit. So when we talk about the immune system, one of the ways we can organize it and organize our thoughts is to organize it via the innate immunity and the adaptive immune response. So you have the two circles that make up this Venn diagram. The innate immune system is innate in the sense that it's always there. It's always humming along and it's a little bit more passive in the sense that like you don't have to really rev it up and get it going quite as much because you're always going to have things like neutrophils and eosinophils and you know, basophils and mast cells and all of these other types of cells. And you're always going to have complement protein. You're always going to have these things scavenging around and being like little Pac-Men and just kind of nomming their way through your body and looking for bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, bits of damaged tissue, bits of not healed tissue, old dead cells that need to be cleaned up. Like they are your Pac-Man and they are your garbage men. So the innate immune response is always there and it's always doing its nice work for you. And mast cells are part of that arm of the immune system. They're always there. They're always on the lookout. They're always there to protect you. The converse of that, relatively so, is the adaptive immune response. These are like the special forces as opposed to the gener general generic Pac-Men that gobble up anything and everything, when you launch an attack with T cells and B cells, AKA lymphocytes, so these are the guys that come out of your lymph nodes when you need them and you're in trouble. When you launch an attack with T cells or B cells or even natural killer cells, it tends to be quite a bit more specific. So rather than saying, hey, you immune cells, go gobble up all the viruses this type of response is going to be more like, hey, we have the flu, you need to do stuff specific to the flu. Or, hey, we have Epstein-Barr virus, you need to go do things specific to Epstein-Barr virus. So the right half of this Venn diagram is more specific, and it takes a couple of days to really get it revved up and going in a larger capacity. But normally these lymphocytes would make up about 30% of your white blood cell count. But let's zoom back in on mast cells. They are not the most common immune cell. That, would, that title would go to the neutrophils, but they're part of that innate immune response and they're always there to protect you. They're always hanging out. And they hang out in virtually every tissue of the body. They're hanging out under the skin, which is why people with histamine intolerance will oftentimes get hives or rashes. They are hanging out in the gut. They are hanging around God knows everywhere in the body, but our focus for the time being is going to be mast cells in the gut, particularly as it relates to IBS and therefore probably SIBO. So the first study that I wanted to show you is this 2017 meta-analysis. If you haven't seen my other videos before, I'll just briefly mention that a meta-analysis or a systematic review, as this paper is, is like the highest level of research you can get because it's taking many different papers from many different organizations and it's accumulating that into a massive study and they're looking at the similarities and differences and they're looking at like, okay, if we have 18 studies on this one topic, is there any similarity between them and can we draw any solid conclusions from many different research studies and many different labs and many different principal investigators and many different countries? Where can we really take home a message? So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis titled Colonic Immune Cells in Irritable Bowel Syndrome, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And they said, just kind of, I'll skip to the good part. Uh, Increases in mucosal immune cells have frequently been observed in irritable bowel syndrome patients. However, this finding is not consistent between studies 
probably due to combination of methodolog methodological variability, population difference, and small sample size. They looked through PubMed and they found 22 studies that comprised 706 IBS patients and 401 control subjects. And the conclusions, they said mast cells and CD3 T cells, again, part of that lymphocyte adaptive immune army, are both increased in colonic biopsies of patients with IBS versus non-inflamed controls. These changes are segmental and sometimes IBS subtype dependent. So that means that it's not generally going to be that the whole colon has more mast cells. It's going to be a section of it. It's going to be segmental. It's going to be like the sigmoid colon or the ascending colon or the descending colon. It's not going to be the entire colon is what that means when they say it's segmental. And then IBS subtype dependent generally is going to be the difference between constipation versus diarrhea versus mixed. The studies that I have seen have suggested that IBS D and IBS M tend to have more of a mast cell abundance in the colonic tissue as opposed to IBS C. That's a little bit less mast cell-y, typically from what I've seen clinically and what I've read about from studies. Um, so it's IBS subtype dependent, and the but they said that the diagnostic value of the quantification of colonic mast cells, uh, mucosal cells, requires further investigation. So they're not recommending it as a big mainstay of IBS workup right now, but it is something that has been pretty consistently observed. So there's at least some research that is starting to say that there's more mast cells in the colon of patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And that makes sense because a lot of people with IBS are going to have candida overgrowth or dysbiosis. They might have something parasitic. They might have something of a bacterial overgrowth nature in the colon. They might have an overt infection. They could just have not enough good bacteria. So maybe they don't have enough bifidobacteria. That's been well documented in IBS. So any of the creepy crawlers that are hanging out in your colon, but the plot thickens, dear readers, dear viewers, because we have this study, and this is a 2019 study. Mast cells are increased in the small intestinal mucosa of patients with irritable bowel syndrome. Again, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So this is a high level, good quality research paper here. And if you think about IBS, I mean, I've said this, I'll say this all day, every day until I'm blue in the face. IBS doesn't tell you anything, not a jack, because it's an umbrella diagnosis. There are people who have IBS who are lactose intolerant. There are people with IBS who have leaky gut or have candida or have SIBO or have Crohn's or have undiagnosed celiac disease, whatever it might be. This umbrella of, oh, hey, you have an irritable bowel doesn't actually tell you that much about what's going on with your body. So when we look at papers, we have to keep that in mind with IBS because truly we don't know these people's, these folks' real diagnoses. Like 50% of these people could have SIBO and 50% of them could have candida or it could be that they all had parasites. We don't know because IBS doesn't tell you that. But nonetheless, they are looking at the small intestinal mucosa and the immune cells in patients with IBS. So just as a note, many of these people probably have SIBO, right? Like the, the studies kind of run the gamut, but I think a base ballpark range of like 60 or 70% of people having IBS in fact have SIBO as one of their diagnoses uh, makes you think, well, I would assume that the small intestine would have more mast cells since the problem in IBS is frequently more localized to the small intestine as opposed to the colon, right? Well, that is what they found. They found data from 344 patients with IBS and 229 controls. So less of a compelling sample size. I think there was 700 something in the colon study that we just looked at. And they looked at studies that measured the number of mast cells in the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. So that is the first part, the second part, and the third part of the small intestine, respectively. The duodenum is the first part, jejunum is the middle part, uh, ileum is the last part before you get to the colon. And they said here that the number of mast cells was significantly higher in the ileum in patients with IBS. Mast cell counts were not statistically different in the duodenum or the jejunum of patients with IBS versus healthy controls. And that makes sense. That makes so much sense if we assume that a lot of these poor people have SIBO. Because remember, with SIBO, 
a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time the bacteria in SIBO is going to come up from the colon. So it has to go through the ileum first. Then if it gets real, real bad, it might get to the jejunum. And then if you have like the worst motility on planet Earth, it might get to the duodenum. But that's kind of a far stretch. That's a long way for the SIBO to travel up. So pretty much everybody with SIBO is going to have overgrowth in the ileum. Not as many people are going to have it in the jejunum, and very few people are going to have overgrowth localized to the duodenum. And that's correlating with what they found with the mast cells, that IBS patients, aka SIBO patients, more than likely, you know, pretty good odds at least, that these patients had higher counts of mast cells in the ileum, but not necessarily in the duodenum or the jejunum. So building, building on that hypothesis. But now things get particularly juicy because this paper came out. And while it's not a human-based paper, it is a hybrid. It's a mouse model and a human study. Um, this is just February of 2021. So this paper, or I'm sorry, January of 2021. This was all over my social media feed. It was all over the IBS and SIBO groups that I'm in and for good reason. So titled, Local Immune Response to Food Antigens Drives Meal-Induced Abdominal Pain. Okay, tell me more, PubMed, tell me more. So they did the little introductory st shtick, and then what they did was they gave mice uh, food poisoning, essentially. They gave them bacterial, uh, ent bacterial enteritis, and they exposed these mice to a bacterial toxin and a bacteria, and also a food antigen. They used the albumin from egg, and they made a note somewhere in here that that is frequently used as a dietary antigen. So all at once they exposed those mice to the bacteria and therefore the bacterial toxin of food poisoning as well as a purified egg albumin as a food antigen. Then after the gastroenteritis was healed, after the food poisoning was healed and they recovered from it, then they went and they exposed these mice to the egg albumin, the same food trigger, and they got a response and the mast cells went wacko and they released histamine. So then they went in and they looked at humans and they said, well, what if happens if we inject food antigens that are associated with IBS, namely gluten, wheat, soy, and milk into the rectal mucosa of patients with IBS? And sure enough, they were able to elicit mast cell activation from these food particles or from these food antigens in humans with IBS. So now they're speculating in this, and I mean, this is not a new theory. I mean, we wouldn't have these big meta-analyses looking at mast cells in IBS if this wasn't already a big theory with IBS. But now they're saying, hey, part of this is driven by the mast cells. And the thing that really is profound, let me see if I can scan here and find it. Ah, here we show that bacterial infection and bacterial toxins can trigger an immune response that leads to the production of dietary antigen-specific IgE antibodies in mice, which are limited to the intestine. That's a big, big biggie. So here we are, well-meaning functional medicine practitioners and naturopaths and nutritionists, and we're going out and we are testing people for food sensitivities and food allergies in blood, when in actuality, the response might be localized to the gut entirely. It might not be that these antibodies are getting out into systemic bloodstream. It might be that it's a totally localized immune response, and therefore our efforts to measure stuff in blood are not going to prove fruitful. And that's okay as long as you know that that's a thing that can happen. This is why the food elimination diet is still the best thing you can do to find out what foods are triggering you. It's it's a painstaking process and it's annoying AF, but if you do that, you stand a better chance of discovering what foods are really triggering for you as opposed to relying on tools that just measure antibodies in your bloodstream. That's not going to tell you the whole piece of the puzzle. Right? That's not going to tell you about the whole puzzle. And this was one of the articles that popped up. Oh, Google, you get out of here. Uh, and this was, again, based on the same paper. So scientists reveal mechanism that causes irritable bowel syndrome. That's kind of clickbaity. I mean, like we've known about the mast cells for quite a while. Um, but they talk about the little introduction. But I did think it was useful to see in more normal talk. Here we go. Oh, 
I guess they don't stay away if I click those off. They said, uh, the professors went to see if people with IBS reacted in the same way. The food antigens were injected into the intestinal wall, the colon, of 12 patients with IBS, and they produced localized immune reactions similar to that seen in mice, and no reaction was seen in the healthy volunteers. And of course, being the drug world, they said a larger clinical trial of the antihistamine treatment is currently underway. And that's great. I mean, antihistamines can be very helpful for IBS. I have had numerous patients where I've recommended that they pursue something like cromulin sodium or some other mast cell treatment through the medical world. It's not that that can't be helpful. It's just that it's not the whole piece of the pie. We need to look beyond just trying to inhibit the mast cells and we need to try to understand them a little bit more so that we can get them to chill the F out. But that's your little primer. So in IBS, and therefore most likely SIBO, there's an increased number of mast cells in the colon, and there's an increased number of mast cells in the last part of the small intestine, which is most likely gonna be affected by SIBO as opposed to the other two parts. And it seems that the local immune response that happens with the food is local. It stays in the intestines and it doesn't necessarily get out into systemic circulation. So then you must be asking, what's a guy or a girl to do? Like, what do you do to calm these little stinkers down? Well, we'll get to that in the next couple of episodes. And of course, Amy and I talked about mast cells and histamine intolerance at great length on the IBS Freedom Podcast. So go ahead and check that out. The IBS Freedom Podcast is on YouTube as well as podcasting apps everywhere. So if you want to visually see Amy and I, or if you just want to, you know, listen to it in audio format, that is okay too. But I will see you in the next couple of videos as we talk more about mast cells and histamine and what the heck to do about it. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.